Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Be someone who cultivates a love for God's Word. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord.
I'm old school. I like to stand for the reading of the word. Unless you're watching at home or you're driving on the radio, don't, please don't stand in your car. That might be dangerous. And so uh, we're in Genesis 12 and verse 2. And uh, God said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and say it with me, I will bless you. And I will make your name great and touch your neighbor and say, and you will be a blessing. Right. Touch your other neighbor, the good-looking one, and say, you were blessed to be a blessing. You were blessed to be a blessing. We are Abraham's spiritual children, and God has blessed us to be a blessing. Amen. And I want to go to the second passage in Matthew 22. Uh, beginning in verse 35, and it's an attorney comes, and he thinks he's so smart and so clever, and he's going to trick Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is like, I made you out of dirt. I can make another one of you in a minute. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't. Yeah, okay, a few, few of you caught that. All right. All right, so one of them, an expert in the law, tested him in this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And the second is like it, unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. For on these two commandments saying, all the law and all the prophets. There's over 700,000 words in the Bible, but one word towers over them all. It's the word love. The Bible says that God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God, and God lives in them. And so as I've been an evangelist for many years, you know, asking God, how can we make a bigger impact? And I this is a couple of years ago on this passage, God said, Brian, you don't got to invent anything. You don't got to make, you don't got to add to what I've already created. I created this. This is my plan to reach the world. That we would love the people in our circle so well, so authentically, so genuinely with unconditional love, that that love would bring them to the feet of Jesus. That we love them so well, their hearts would open to the gospel. So touch your neighbor and say you were blessed to be a blessing. Amen. Awesome. Hey, give two people a high five and grab your seats in the presence of God today. So to make an impact on the world around us, we use this acronym called BLESS. Everyone say BLESS. Yes. Look at your neighbor very awkwardly and say, bless you. All right. So here's the thing. It's universal. Everybody wants to be blessed. Muslims want to be blessed. Hindus want to be blessed. Atheists want to be blessed. Uh, especially Pentecostals want to be blessed. Uh, everybody wants to be blessed. And so how do we bless people that are far from God? How do we make an impact in their life? So I want to just share with you five quick principles. It's an acronym of BLESS. And so I want to talk to you about BLESS. It's the way that I believe that Jesus modeled for us. So B stands for, say it with me, begin with prayer. Begin. Say it in your out loud voices again. Say begin with prayer. Begin. Slap your neighbor, wake him up. That was a really long story. And say begin with prayer. All right. All right, so begin with prayer. Who you pray for, you care for. The moment I started praying for Maz, I started caring for him. I no longer saw a Muslim. I no longer saw a criminal. I saw a person created in the image of God, an image bearer of Christ, valuable with intrinsic value to God and to me. Who you pray for, you care for. And I've learned that when you pray for people by name, specifically, just pray for orphans, pray for some orphans, pray for widows, pray for some specific widows, pray for Muslims, get win a billion Muslims to Christ or a billion Hindus, you can reach one. You can reach, everyone can reach one person. And so I began to pray for them, and I discovered that when you pray for people personally by name, two things happen. First things that happen is that God moves in your heart. <laughs> the real transformation actually happens in you, actually, more than them. You have to change before they change. Because prayer is more than a conversation with God, it's an impartation from God. So when I start to pray for people, I start to love them, I start to care about them, I start to get involved in their story. I can't dismiss them anymore because now I care for them. Are you with me? And then as I care for them and I love them and I share with them and I break bread, and then God begins to open their hearts to the gospel. Of course, it is only the gospel that saves. It's only the gospel. But I've learned that it's love and friendship, breaking of bread, listening, caring, serving, that opens the heart to the gospel. Are you with me? So the Bible says in Isaiah 43, 1, I've called you by name. God knows your name. If you feel invisible today, 
If you feel all alone, you feel like, hey, at my school, nobody knows me, nobody plays with me, nobody cares about me, I feel all alone, you're not alone. You're not alone. God of the universe knows your name and calls you by name. Amen. Amen. That would have been a good place to, you know, maybe give God a shout of praise or something. <laughs> Are you with me? Call me by my name. Call me. So pray for people by name. So B, begin with prayer. L stands for listen to them. Say it with me. Touch your neighbor and say listen to them. So I've learned that the, the key to effective evangelism is authentic relationships. And relationships are built one conversation at a time. Maz and I built a relationship, a white Evangelical preacher and a, a black Muslim ex-convict built a relationship. Our worlds were different, but love is the universal language. And we built that relationship one conversation at a time. And there was some colorful language, you know, not PG in those conversations. You know, you're like, okay, I've never heard the F word used that many times. Like in three sentences, that was uh, brilliant, kind of sinful, I don't know. But, uh, you know, you have to really listen to people. You get to know their hurts their pain, their stories, their doubts, their fears, and not try and fix them. <laughs> Just really listen to their hurt and their pain. James 1.19 says, my brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. How many of you know we do the exact opposite of this? <laughs> we are slow to listen. My mother used to always say, you know, Brian, God gave you two ears for a reason. And only one mouth. It's like, but he gave me 10 toes. What does that mean? I don't know. So, uh, but anyway, be, be quick to listen, slow to speak. But we're, we're fast to speak. We're slow to listen. We're quick to get angry. The Bible says, flip the script. You want to see your marriage change? Do this one verse for a month. Listen to your spouse. Be slow to get angry. Calmate, muchacho. Right? Calm down, you know. And uh, be slow to speak and slow to become angry. We gotta really listen to people. E stands for eat with them. Touch your neighbor and say, eat with them. Yeah. Now, full disclosure, this is my favorite part of evangelism. You know, uh, I'm carrying about 25 pounds more than I did when I got married for a reason, okay? And I love to eat, and I love eating with people, and I love making new friends. And I've discovered that there's such magical power in food. Such magical power in food. Uh, because you just sit and talk, and their wall, defense, their walls are up. Every business deal I've ever closed, ministry deal I've ever closed happened over food because their hearts open up and they start talking and you start sharing stories. Before you know it, you're in their life and you know something about them that has nothing to do with the deal with the ministry or the partnership. And now you know them personally and they trust you because you have to earn people's trust. And food is the, one of the fastest ways to get there. So I, I love this quote. Uh, in his book, A Meal with Jesus, Tim Chester says that Jesus did evangelism and discipleship around uh, a table with some grilled fish, a loaf of bread, and a pitcher of wine. Jesus was a relational leader who broke bread with people. So here's the big idea. You're going to have about 21 meals a week, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Some of us more, some of us less, but we're going to have about 21 meals a week. Could you share one of them with someone far from God? One out of 21. That's less than 5%. We make time in your schedules every week to share a meal, a coffee, a rainbow's tea with hot milk, four scoops of sugar, uh, with someone far from God. So two weekends ago, I flew to Austin, Texas. Wasn't on the way to Guatemala, back home where I live now with my family. Because there was one man I wanted to see, a friend of mine named Tyson. Um, he leads a Fortune 500 company. It's the number one computer chip company in the world. And uh, met him about two and a half years ago. He, he invited me to serve on his foundation. Not a believer and it's not a Christian foundation. So we did some things together in the city of Austin. And I wrote his name down. I started praying for Tyson every day and his wife, Nicole. And as I prayed for him, I started to care for him. And he's an atheist. He does not believe in God. And over two and a half years of friendship, praying for him every day, listening to him, eating with him, serving him, his heart is opening to the gospel. So I thought, I need to go see Tyson. So I flew to Austin to have breakfast with Tyson. We had an hour. He said, man, I got an hour. It went three hours. 
At the end, I said, Tyson, would you, would you be my CEO coach? I want to be a better leader. Um, and you lead one of the greatest companies in America. You're an incredible leader. He's on the board of the Federal Reserve. So I said, man, would you teach me how to be a better leader and a better CEO? And I want to learn from you how to make money. I know how to spend money. I don't know how to make money. So I said, would you teach me and would you be my CEO coach? And he goes, on only one condition. Would you be my spiritual coach? He choked up and he said, I'll teach you how to make money if you teach me how to, the meaning of life. You never know what one conversation can do in someone's life. One breaking of bread with someone far from God. This is what Jesus did so well. In Matthew 9, Jesus is walking along and he sees the tax collector's booth. These were people who worked for Rome to collect taxes for the occupying empire that had taken away their nation. So you remember in the Bible, the worst curse word they could say was, you're ugly. Well, yeah, you're mean. Oh, yeah, well, you're a tax collector. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's a curse word to say that word because of what it represented to them. They were working for the Roman Empire, taking their taxes, taking their freedoms, and they despised any Jew that worked for Rome. And here's Matthew, a Jewish man, collecting taxes for the enemy. And what the tax collectors would do is they would get a little something, something for them. So, you know, you owe, you owe Rome 30%, you owe me 24%. It's like, what? You know, so they would add to that money for them, and they were getting wealthy off the Jews. So they hated them. No rabbi worth his salt would ever go to the home of a tax collector. And yet here Jesus walks by his booth, says, hey, Matthew, I'm coming to your house tonight for dinner. Shrimp on the barbie. I don't know if he literally said that, but I'm just saying you know, come in tonight, maybe grilled fish, and uh, pitch your wine, come to your house tonight for dinner, invite your friends. The Bible says that night in Matthew 9, 10, as she was having supper at Matthew's house, some very disreputable characters came for dinner because Jesus did discipleship around the supper table. It was an act in the Middle East, eating dinner with someone is not just a meal, it's an act of a symbol of friendship, acceptance, and love. It's very spiritual meaning. He breaks bread with them. So I wonder who you need to invite to your home for dinner. I wonder whose house you need to go to. Someone far from God. And break bread with them. And uh, had a, had a Muslim imam in my city. And uh, I started praying for him every day. And one day he says, uh, I've never met anyone that loves like you love. He starts crying. He says, would, would, would you come to the Islamic Center of New Mexico? Would you be willing to come have lunch with me? And I said, absolutely, I would love to break bread with you. Now, the Islamic Center of New Mexico, the previous imam had been arrested by the FBI for terrorism. It's a true story. It was a very ugly thing that happened. This was the new imam that had come in. So I told my family that night, I was like, hey, guys, guess where I'm going to lunch? The Islam Center of New Mexico. And my son goes, Dad, isn't that where the guy got arrested by the FBI? I was like, well, the previous pastor, you know, not the current one, but the, the previous guy. And he's like, you're not going to go. What if they try and kill you? I'm like, I'm watching too much 24, you know, too much Jack Bowers. I was like, God, I don't think they're going to try and kill me or anything. And I said, but I'm taking the chief of police with me just in case, you know. So, uh, and I did take the chief with me. And so, you know, and we had a time. Who do you need to break bread with? My friend Craig Rochelle says, if you want to reach people, no one's reaching. You got to do some things no one's doing. You got to take some risks. I wonder if this week you would take a risk and walk across the office to that guy that's belligerent and angry and makes fun of Christians and say, hey, man, can I take you to lunch? That neighbor that's very rude and ugly and nasty to you, what if you just, there's probably some pain there. What about that family member that cut you off, that wronged you, that betrayed you? What if you were to invite them to the supper table? I'm just saying, maybe God might move through that. So begin with prayer. Say it with me. Begin with prayer. Amen. Listen to them. Amen. Eat with them. Amen. And the S stands for serve them. Everybody say serve them. Serve. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's not just a quaint saying. It's true. Maz didn't care how much I knew about the Bible. He didn't care I'd read the gospel 40 times. He didn't care that I had seminary degrees. He wanted to know, do you care about me? Because his Christian stepdad had abused him and got him selling drugs. So 
There was a history. There was a hurt. There was a pain there. There was a story. Everyone has a story. People don't care how much you know. Do they know how much you care? And Jesus modeled for us so brilliantly the fastest way to someone's heart is to serve them. Jesus said in Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Serve people. You want to win their heart, serve them. Find a need in their life and meet it or introduce them to someone who can. If you can't meet that need, help connect them to the resources that can meet that. In other words, you got to find an itch and scratch it. You know what I'm saying? Like you're on the airplane, you're like, I can't get that one spot right there. And then you're like, I don't want to ask the stewardess, you know. I might get kicked off the plane, you know, today. You don't know what might happen. So touch your neighbor and say, find an itch and scratch it. Right? Just find a need in their life and meet it. And the last S stands for share Jesus. Everybody say share Jesus. Now, we, we tend to think that, that this is where the gospel starts. I tell you, the whole thing is the gospel. The whole thing is evangelism. This is the communication of the gospel, but the whole thing is evangelism. The moment you start praying for them, the moment you start listening to them, the moment you start eating with them, the moment you start serving them, evangelism has already begun. Real biblical discipleship has begun. And yes, there is a time where you need to share the gospel. But the gospel has no meaning to them if it's not in the context of love and relationship. Love your neighbor as yourself. We got to love people so well that by the time we get to share the gospel, I had loved Ma so well by the grace of God that by the time I got to share the gospel, he was ready. So who in your life is God calling you to love so that you can earn trust to share? And I love how Paul did it. You know, Paul explains and models for us how to share our faith. I'm like, hey, if it's good enough for the apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. So in Acts 22, he says, here's what I was like before Christ. It's the first part of your story. Who were you before? I wasn't a drug dealer. My brother was. I'm not getting any up to share faith. This is who I was. I grew up in church. I was a pastor. I was this. But, you know, man, Christ has changed my life. I'm starting to love people I didn't know I could ever love. And I'm having meals with people I knew I never thought I would have meals with. That's changed my life. Tell people who you are. So before Christ, he says, and then I was on the road to, to Damascus to persecute more Christians, put them in prison, and Christ met me. Knocked me off my horse. Says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus of Nazareth. So he meets Christ in the real way. So before Christ, Christ, and then he shares what happened after Christ. And since he met, I met Christ, this is what he's done in my life. Because people don't know our God, but they know us. And this is called incarnational Christianity. The Bible says in John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh. And he became one of us. And we, he looked like us. God became one of us. We got to become one of them. Paul said, I will do all things and become all things to reach all people. Anything short of sin, we got to do that. Become all things to all people. To love them right where they're at. Offer them hope and faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only one that saves. It's our job to love them so well, their hearts open to the one and only Savior. And we see in John 4, 28, I love the story of the woman at the well. I'd present to you that she was one of the most effective evangelists in the Bible. She'd never been to church, never been water baptized, never been through new doctrine class. I'm not saying those things aren't good. But the day she met Christ, she met hope. She met love, unconditional love, for the first time. She'd had five failed marriages shacked up with a guy now, living in sin, and Jesus just cuts right through all that, speaks right to her heart with unconditional love. No other rabbi would have stood there and talked to her, but Jesus did. And in Jesus, she found love, and she found hope. She found amazing grace. And the Bible says she, she ran back to her town, and she told everybody in Samaria, about this Jesus, come see him. Could this not be the Messiah? And the Bible says the whole town came out. The whole town. And many of them believed on Jesus. Love people so well. Bless them so well that by the time you get to share the gospel, their hearts are ripe and their hearts are open because you've loved them with God's love. Are you with me today? 